Hello. Just checking that you can all hear me. Okay. Well, full house. Fabulous. Looks a little different than usual. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think we're going to have a really lovely afternoon. So good afternoon and welcome to the Scottish Parliament. I'm Alison Johnston, MSP and presiding officer of the Scottish Parliament and delighted to welcome you all to the final event of this year's 2024 Festival of Politics. This year's event is the festival's 20th year of welcoming audiences to engaging debate and discussion on wide ranging and thought provoking issues. And I'm so pleased that you're here to take part in this important debate on the Scottish Parliament at 25, 25 years. And we're in partnership today with Scotland's Futures Forum. I'll be inviting you to get involved with questions, putting them to our fabulous panel here and also making contribution and comment. And if you'd like to share your thoughts as we go through the afternoon, you can do that at Visit Scott Parle on X or on Instagram at Scott Parle. And the event is being recorded and it will be available on the Scottish Parliament's YouTube channel in the coming weeks. And before I introduce our panellists, I would also like to welcome our BSL interpreters today, Jemina Napier and Andy Carmichael, and thank them for their support. I'm going to begin to introduce our panellists. And with us today is Olivia Brown. And Olivia is a member of the Scottish Youth Parliament. She's the Vice Chair of the Parliament and represents the constituency of Midlothian North and Musselburgh. And the Scottish Youth Parliament has campaigned, I think, always very successfully, in my opinion, um, on many issues such as votes at 16, equal marriage, and more recently, the incorporation of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child into Scots law. And since joining the Youth Parliament, Olivia has spent time working with other members of the Youth Parliament on matters she cares very deeply about, such as education and sustainable fashion. Ken McIntosh, on my right here. Uh, well, Ken is now a parliamentary consultant, but you will possibly know him better as an MSP um, for many, many years, and of course, previous presiding officer of the parliament. Ken was born in Inverness, went to school in Portree in Oban, went on to study history at Edinburgh University, and began his career with the BBC before being elected to the parliament in 1999. It does say a little here about how Ken isn't very good at playing tennis, but I would actually dispute that I haven't seen him in action. Um, but we can discuss such matters as, as we go on. Now I'm going to introduce Lord McConnell of Glen Scorisdale, Jack McConnell, who was the first Minister of Scotland between 2001 and 2007. Jack was a UK Special Representative for Peacebuilding between 2008 and 2010, before being appointed to the House of Lords in 2010. And Jack was an MSP for Motherwell and Wishaw between 1999 to 2011. And I think we will hear more of Jack's illustrious career as the afternoon goes on and we discuss very many issues. Esther Roberton is an expert in civic, corporate and constitutional governance and is a passionate advocate for clarity of purpose, consensus, collaboration and community involvement to build a route map to a fairer Scotland. Esther is a board member of Scotland's Futures Forum and she spent a lifetime in public service, most recently as chair of NHS Lothian. And I think it's important to note that in the 1990s, Esther was the coordinator of the Scottish Constitutional Convention, whose 1995 publication, Scotland's Parliament, Scotland's Right, provided the blueprint for devolution. And we move on to Brian, who may not need much introduction. Brian is a writer, broadcaster, author, lecturer and after-dinner speaker. He's a columnist for The Herald and regular broadcaster, mainly on politics and current affairs. And Brian is the former political editor of BBC Scotland. And before joining the BBC, Brian worked in newspapers and including as a lobby correspondent at Westminster. And I think it's very important that I mention that Brian is also, in his spare time, a passionate supporter of Dundee United Football Club. <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to ask the, our panellists a few questions to set the scene, and then we will open to yourselves um, for discussion. 
So I'm going to kick off. I think I'll put this question, well, we'll, we'll see how we go. But this, this, the first question I'm going to ask is, do you think the Scottish Parliament has lived by its founding principles of accountability, openness, power sharing and equal opportunities? And I think I'll put that question to, I'm going to put it to Ken in the first instance. Uh, yes, is the short answer. So uh, there's, there's been quite a lot of criticism uh, labelled or, or thrown at the Parliament in, in recent years uh, for not living up to some of the expectations that were there back in 1999. Um, Perhaps some of the, 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 and I'm not sure they're entirely justified either, some of the criticisms around uh, consensual working and cross-party working and so on. Um, but I think in terms of the principles, the Parliament absolutely has been there. They go up and down. So, for example, openness or transparency, that has had high points and low points. Uh, and it very much reflects the, or it can reflect the attitude of the government of the day. But in terms of creating a forum the centrepiece of discussion here in Scotland, it has been undoubtedly hugely successful. Scottish politics has been transformed in the 25 years it's been here. So Scotland, when the first parliament came along in 1999, was a different place. It was the place where the very first thing that we did when we came in was take on the homophobic law that was Clause 28. And if you think about that now, how, how the distance we've travelled since then. And it's very much a participative parliament. This sort of event sums up the way the parliament has lived up to its principles. And that's just in my view. Thank you very much, Ken. Um, Olivia, what, what do you think? I mean, for me, I look at this in the context of how these values have impacted young people. Um, and it's obviously quite difficult to quantify and define, particularly as I'm only 19 years old, so I have not even been alive for the entirety of this Parliament's existence. Um, but, <laughs> but um, I think when you look in particular at that value of equal opportunity, um, particularly in how the Parliament works with and interacts and involves young people, um, it's just gotten better and better since devolution. Um, I think it, it evidences itself in so many ways. For example, we at the Scottish Youth Parliament now have a working agreement with the Scottish Parliament, which yourselves know way too much about. Um, but it means that we are, the Parliament and the government is what accountable to us young people because we have a meeting with the Cabinet every year, the meeting with Scottish Government execs every year. We're about to hold yet another sitting in this very chamber in October. Um, and all of these things means that young people's voices are better highlighted in Scottish political spaces. Um, and I think the pinnacle of that has been UNCRC incorporation, which means that the government and parliament now has a legal duty to look at how their actions impact young people's rights. Um, I still think there's a way to go, particularly around accessibility to the parliament and to politics, that comes in particularly in education and how we teach young people about politics. Um, but I think how far the parliament has come with how it engages young people is something to be incredibly proud of. It's without a doubt one of the best places to be a young person in the world. Okay. Thank you very much, Olivia. And Jack. Sometimes, <clears throat> I think I would say, which may be the same answer as Ken, just in a slightly different uh, putting it a slightly different way. At, at its best, the Parliament definitely has been that forum to speak for Scotland and to legislate for Scotland. It's its main, main purpose. Um, I think, as Ken said, there, there have been good days and bad days in that. Uh, I think on uh, providing a, a, a place and a forum, um, a vehicle for engaging with people, including young people, um, and uh, including people, many more people from different uh, backgrounds and um, maybe different personal conditions uh, than, than, than in the past. I think the Parliament has done a, a very good job in that. Um, ironically, maybe not quite as good at the politics, given it's a Parliament of politicians, uh, than at that kind of administration that, and how it operates. Um, and you know, I think on the, on, on the political side, um, I don't think the Parliament's always lived up to the original commitment to um, transparency, cross-party working, um, accountability of the executive. 
Um, and I think the basic values of the Parliament have been important because they have reminded people time and again why we're here and, and, and what we're about. But at the same time, ultimately, the Parliament is made up of those who are members of it, and they have strengths and failings, and uh, it's up to the electorate to hold them to account for that. Okay, thank you very much, Jack. And Esther? Can I, first of all, I'm really struggling to hear, so can you check that everybody out there can hear? Can I hear Jack, but I struggle to hear the three of you. Okay, everybody can, can okay? I just check no, just that me. you can all hear? If there's anyone who can't hear? Okay, let's just make sure that we are, yeah, we are mic'd up, but let's make sure that we're as clear as possible. And if anyone is having any issues with that at all, please just stick up your hand and let me know. Thank you. That's, thanks, Alison. Um, to come back to the, the original question, and I would agree with a lot of, of what um, Jack and Ken have said, we'll talk, I suspect, a bit later about the broader expectations, but on the specific principle of Parliament has done pretty well. One of the things I love when I come here is to see the number of school children that are out in the foyer that are coming to visit and all of that. Um, people that you know, would not normally have ever got a trip to Westminster are able to come here. I think the committee, this chamber, they're all much more accessible. I think on openness and transparency, even I, who was involved in, in kind of setting up the, the standing orders, have to remind myself sometimes to differentiate between the parliament and government because I don't think they are always the same um, in that situation. And there can be lots of questions about openness and transparency about government that don't apply to the parliament. But I think overall, I would say we've done pretty well in that transparency and accessibility in particular. Um, as I say, you know, I would chair Jack's view and we'll come back to it, no doubt, about the wider aspirations that we might not have lived up to. But I think on that one, we've done pretty well. Thank you. And finally, on this one, to Brian on those founding principles. I think broadly, parliaments do three things. They make the law, they uh, hold a governing executive to account, and they ventilate issues of concern to the people who elected them. And I think it's kind of two cheers on, on, on each of these. On, on being a, a forum, I think the parliament has definitely developed uh, uh, its role as a as a national forum, pretty much everything from the, the, you know, the state of our health service to the state of our football team, um, both somewhat mixed, um, r r end, end up being discussed here. The caveats I'd put in that mean it's only two cheers on, on the, the legislation. I think the parliament was far too eager to legislate in the, in the early days and, and f a, a little too uh, uh, in, inclined to avoid the precision of uh, scrutiny that, that is required for legislation sometimes. I, I, I really welcome the idea of uh, an open consultation at the start of the legislative pr process to discuss the, 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 the purpose of the legislation in the first place. I think that's excellent. It's the later line-by-line -line scrutiny that perhaps is done a little too hastily. I also think the committees have become too partisan. They have lost the objective was that, they, that committee members would, have, would see that as a role in itself, a career in itself, and that has, that has certainly gone to, to, to some extent, and not just under one party, but, but, but under all. On, on open and transparent, as a journalist, I tried my level best for more than three decades to make Scottish politics as open and transparent as possible, not always with uh, um, uniform or universal success. But, it, but it's, I, I think there is a, a sense here of openness, a sense here of, of involving people. A final comment uh, the, uh, on that business of involving people. Again, just latterly, uh, and, and it's, it's not, not a partisan point, it's a point of the structure and the nature of the parliament. They've become a little too inclined to use the usual suspects for, for everything evidence to committees. I'd like to see a wider approach, as there was in the earlier days, of getting out. And in that regard, I particularly welcome the, the petitions committee that, that manages to give a access to views that are not always heard and not always sought by, by Parliament. But I, I, think it's done, I think it's done well. I think it's done well by the people of Scotland. I think it has met most of its early objectives. Okay, thank you very much indeed. I think um, I'm certainly aware that our communities and participation team are and Parliament generally is very live to the fact that we need to be hearing evidence from the broadest range of people possible. Um, but, you know, I appreciate the points that, that all panellists have, have made there. After 25 years of devolution and a referendum on Scottish independence, 10 years ago now, what are your views on how devolution needs to evolve? And do you think the Scottish public is ready for that? I'm going to go to Jack first on this one. Well, I certainly think we should learn from the experience of, of the 25 years in the way that the Parliament works. Uh, you know, I think there have been, um, as we, I think we would probably all agree, 
those good days and bad days. There's been some great legislation. There's been some maybe poorer legislation that wasn't subject to the right level of, of scrutiny. There's been some great debates and some great speeches. There's been other days when you maybe wouldn't want to be in the gallery. Um, but I think at the same time, there are things that you can learn. You know, we had, there was a basic set of principles back in 98 and 99, which were really all about not being as old fashioned and out of touch as we perceived the Westminster Parliament to be at that time. To be, in some ways, a little bit more European, that's what this, this chamber here was all about. Um, and, and therefore to be a bit more consensual. And although we set it up in that way, actually I don't think it's the consensual parliament that we were originally um, hoping. And in some ways the chamber has become quite a partisan place rather than, um, uh, uh, rather than a, a place that brings ideas together and looks for compromise. Um, and I think Brian makes a very good point about, about accountability and scrutiny. And I think there are maybe three areas where that's a bit of a problem. One is that I think having a single chamber parliament, you have to be very careful to open yourself up to scrutiny from outside. And I, th I think we've all hoped over the years that that would happen organically, but maybe it needs a structure, some kind of forum in Scotland. Maybe it's the youth parliament, but maybe something, maybe something else um, involving the local authorities and other interests, but some kind of forum that operates as a a sounding board, a check on the decisions that are being made in here. So if they are being made at speed, they can be, um, they can be rectified. I think there's a real issue with the committees. Um, one of the things that has changed at Westminster in the last 25 years that hasn't changed here is that the individual committee chairs are much more powerful. Uh, they're elected by the backbenchers of the parties um, and they stand uh, uh, not on, on an equivalence with government ministers, but they definitely are a counterbalance to government ministers that's really strong. And you can see that all the time in the, um, in, in, in the way that they operate. They have an independence from their parties and from government that is really helpful, I think, for scrutiny. And uh, so I think, that's, I, think, I, think, I think that's really important. Um, and I've forgotten my third point, so I'll just shut up at that point. <laughs> I'm sure we will, we will come back to it. I should say that our Standards and Procedures Committee are currently undertaking an inquiry into whether or not conveners should be elected. Um, so we'll just pick up on that point there. Um, Esther, what are your thoughts? I think there's a real series of questions in there. And when Ken was presiding officer, when we were marking the 20th anniversary, um, he reconvened the CSG and nine of the original 13 uh, met. And we produced a report that came into the Festival of Politics then and I was revisiting that, and actually, to answer your question, I realise not much has changed in those five years. We had Henry MacLeish, Jim Wallace and George Reid, who had all been in the Parliament, having helped write these standing orders. And we had a unanimity that there were four big issues. One was the point you've just made, the culture. The convention scheme was done through a process of consensus. And I know this man's probably white haired because of some of the hard work he and his colleagues had to do with the other parties and the others to reach that consensus. And we were really optimistic that that's what would happen in here and that this chamber would help. And sadly, that hasn't been the case. And the debate has become pretty toxic at times and not really encouraging. One MSP said to me, I watched us one day and looked up and thought, what kind of example? are we setting to these school children that are sitting up here? The second was, it hadn't been bold enough, and I think that's still an issue, and I, my hope for the next 25 years is it's much bolder. And the third is about devolving power out of Holyrood, because we've signed up to subsidiarity, to local government being much more powerful, having much more freedom. And then there was the, the, the unilateral, uh, unicameral, the technical term. We all believed the committees would be powerful enough to hold the executive to account. But one of the reasons they haven't been, which we never envisaged, is that the, the governments of the day, and again, I don't think it's just this government, I think it's true of all of them, have legislated for far too much. And if you go back to the principles, it talks about a participative approach to the development, consideration and scrutiny of policy and legislation. And that policy word was put in there by Henry McLeish because he said, Governments don't need to legislate for everything. And at a recent event, we heard someone say, we keep legislating for rights 
when we have no way to deliver on those rights? Why are we legislating for that? So for me, I would hope, get back to consensus, get back to deciding, do we really need to legislate for all of this stuff? Be bolder and let's start pushing powers out to local councils and local communities and allow the parliament the, to do the bits that only they can do. And coming back to your point, Jack, one of the debates that's now growing is maybe the answer is let's have a citizens' assembly as that accountability. Let's have some kind of by, by rote, like jury service. People elected to sit on a, a citizens' chamber for a year or two years and be the people that then challenge the parliament and the government. Because the principle says, account, exec, accountable to parla parliament, accountable to the people. Well, let's find a mechanism for the people. Okay, thank you. Esther, Brian? I mean, I think the, at one point, I think the hereditary dukes of Scotland offered collectively to, to, to set themselves up as a, as a second chamber. I, I, I think that was a little ducal gag, actually. I think it was a little joke, but I, I, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure we need a second chamber. And, and, and I, I, I yield to Esther on, on the, the concept of a citizens' assembly. I'm not sure that would be anything other than, than a, a, a bureaucratic addition. But I, you know, I'm per per persuaded, per prepared to be persuaded. I think this parliament itself requires to uh, get its scrutiny of powers in, in order and I, and I would be more impressed with the changes of that nature. With regard to the, we're talking about tensions, we're talking about difficulties. I mean democracy is a, a flawed system. Churchill said it was the worst system of them all apart from all the others. Uh, and when you have a, a democratic system you have some people elected who could comfortably and, and, and easily hold down a career in in business or the professions, and you have some that you wouldn't send for a message, and 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 that's that's the nature of, of democratic, uh, 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 the democratic occurrence. And I think we, we we take that and we work with the the team that we have. I think there is a reasonable degree of uh, of seeking consensus within this parliament. I think the, the tensions, as as a, a reasonable degree, the tensions as exist are particularly between governments, um, currently between the Scottish and and the UK government. Um, the Scottish Government have having an agenda uh, which is, is, is a constitutional agenda which is, is well known but the UK Government in, in recent years seeking to bypass this place in, in some of the, 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 the legislation and the announcements they make and seeking to if you like remind Scotland that, that, it, that it has a, a second government beyond the one at, at Holyrood Butte House and, and St Andrew's House and that, that's a source of, of tension as well but I believe in practice on the ground among senior and, and indeed junior civil servants they, they just get on with the business of trying to uh, produce a, a, a form of governance that, that works. Thank you very much and Olivia how do you think devolution needs to evolve? Things that we've all already touched on in the first like 10 minutes of this panel, for me, it is education and accessibility and a more participatory democracy. Um, at the end of the day, that means the meaningful participation of seldom heard voices, in particular, in particular young people. Um, but, you know, my earliest memory of learning about politics in school is like, second year of high school which is ridiculous before that didn't have much grasp of how parliament works what makes parliament different from government um, and we were just talking before this panel about the low turnout of young people in elections and that is because we are not provided the tools to make informed decisions or to see the importance of politics in our daily lives um, and that has changed over the years it has improved with things like the scottish youth parliament and so sector organisations but ultimately we have a responsibility to our young people if we want them to take over this parliament in five ten years we need to give them the tools to do so um, I think meaningful participation to me is as I say providing the tools to develop informed throughout legislative processes so that means in committees and um, in the parliament as a whole um, and then making sure that young people can see where their voices and opinions have had an impact in that final decision. Um, you made a really interesting point Esther about how we're legislating for rights but we don't have the facilities to deliver on those rights. That is where meaningful participation of seldom heard voices comes in um, because at the end of the day that is what preserves our institutions and allows for informed decision-making and well-made legislation. 
And finally, Ken, on the evolution of yeah, devolution. I'll, I'll, so I'll pick up on a couple of points I agree with, first of all, which the S's point about being bold. I think in the end, the Parliament should be judged on what it does for people, more than anything else. I mean, we're talking about, at the moment, we're talking about how Parliament operates, but to many, most people, they don't care how Parliament operates. Is it delivering for us? Is it actually tackling poverty, improving our health, growing the economy and so on, and, and making this a better country to live in? And that's, that's in the end, uh, how we should be judged. And, and I think a bolder Parliament would, would, be, uh, would be a real, you know, a real plus. Uh, I, I'd also agree, I think we've all commented on the fact that legislation, that the Parliament it carried out a huge amount of legislation in the first um, four to eight uh, years uh, which was tremendously successful, the Land Reform Act, the Smoking Act, abolition of pindings and warrant sales. I was just going to chuck that one in for Esther's sake. Did anybody remember the abolition of pindings and warrant sales? It was just, it was just a bill from Tommy Sheridan that was picked up by, uh, by Labour and SNP and others. Um, but, you know, just small things like that made a difference. And all these bills were very successful. And there was also a sort of a, back, a backlog of bills that hadn't gone through Westminster. And the Scottish Parliament was able to grasp these and the trouble was they were so successful that they created this idea that the way to get things done through the Scottish Parliament was to legislate. And of course, what's happened is that the, probably the main purpose of Parliament, which is about fiscal responsibility, has, is the one that suffered. So you're here to hold the government to account for the money they're spending on your behalf, taxpayers' money. And if you think about the Scottish Parliament and how fiscally responsible has the Scottish Parliament been, it's, it's probably one of our biggest weaknesses, I think. So. Um, so, so there needs to be a change of emphasis about fiscal responsibility more than anything else. And there has been an attempt to improve the budget process, which I think has helped, but um, probably a greater emphasis in that area. Where I'm going to, nice, I'm going to disagree with Esther now, just to start things off, uh, and perhaps others, is that I, this idea that we've not been cross-party is, I, I just think, not true in the slightest. The, the, we inherited a two-party system. You know, Westminster, you're either going to have a Labour government or a Conservative government, the Scottish Parliament has been multi-party from the word go. It's still multi-party. You can only ever, there's been one, one majority government from 2011. Uh, everything else has been, okay, very large minorities, but still minorities. So you've always had to do deals with other parties. The, the first minority government was that of, because there was a coalition in the early years, between a formal coalition between Labour and, and Lib Dems. The 2007, 2007 Alex Salmond government was held in place by by the support of the Conservatives. I mean, if that's not cross-party working, the SNP and the Conservatives holding together to run the, the, the government. So I think cross-party working has always happened. Not only that, people vote for parties. People do not vote for independent. I was really interested, Dennis Canavan's here. So Dennis uh, and, and Margaret MacDonald are the only two people I'm aware of who were voted in as independents on their own name. Everybody else is voted in because they're in a political party. So it's actually, and that's because political parties get things done. They're the vehicles to make things happen in, in parliaments. So it's not surprising if people vote for parties that parties do dominate. Now, we can go into how, how, how much they dominate and how, perhaps how they should be reformed. But I, I do think there's been quite a lot of cross-party working. And I think that the, the, the divide that's come in, that the Scottish Parliament was not set up to deal with, has been the new divide in politics, which is along the Constitution. So when the Parliament was set up in 99, uh, the divide was, you know, it was left wing to right wing and a, a, a spectrum of politics. And then in the build up to 10 years ago now, 2014, the new divide has taken over between those for independence and those against. And that divide, that divide is a binary divide. There's, you, you can actually say there's a lot, SNP and Labour and Liberals and Greens in particular, but I would actually argue even the Conservatives and I think I can see an old colleague, Bill Bowman, up there as well. You know, we'd argue that the Scottish Conservatives are a relatively progressive party, if, if I may. Oh, I'm not insulting you all, Bill. There, but. So, so the parties have got a lot in common, but unfortunately on the, on the constitutional divide, that really has split the parliament and, and created this, um, this, certainly this appearance, if not the reality, of a very divided uh, forum. I think as well, maybe on that point too, I think, I mean, I was first an MSP staffer in 1999 and I believe that social media has had a huge impact on our discourse, um, not just external to this chamber, but of course it just impacts on, on social discourse generally. And I think we're now working in a 
in a, in a different era. You know, back in 99, if you had a bad day, it might be reported in the media, but it being a newspaper, it would, it would disappear. Now things hang around. I think, it, I think it does lend. Social media obviously has... It can have tremendously positive impact, but I think it causes a lot of concerning impact as well, that people feel... I mean, personally, you know, it can be a tool that actually prevents people getting involved in the first place. So I think we are operating in a different time I and mean, things are discussed in a different way. Anyway, I will not labour that point at this, at this moment. I think we've got our discussion up and running and I'm now going to open to the chamber, to you. So please put your, your questions and comments to the panel. If you'd like to ask a question, I'd be grateful if you could raise your hand. Um, and we'll get to you as soon as possible. And if you're able, when your mic goes on, the little red light will go on. Please stand if you are able. Um, I'd obviously be grateful if we can try and keep our, our questions and answers succinct so that we can get in as many people as possible. That would be smashing. I am seeing, funnily enough, the first three hands that have all gone up um, are all previous. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I'm going to... I'm not going to say what order I'm going. I was thinking alphabetically, date of birth. Anyway, I'm going to go to Dennis Canavan first. Dennis. Should I stand? Um, yes, if you're able, Dennis. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I was a Westminster MP for 25 years before being elevated to the Scottish Parliament in 1999. And uh, I was the only independent uh, MSP uh, at that time. Uh, and uh, in my experience, I think that uh, um, the Scottish Parliament um, is superior in so many respects uh, to uh, Westminster. Uh, but um, I have to disagree with some of what has been said by some of the, the panellists. I, I don't think that there is enough cross-party collaboration, and I think that there is far too much control freakery and the two things are interrelated uh, because what happens in the Scottish Parliament, because it's a much smaller Parliament than, than Westminster, um, then um, the control freakery uh, is greater because the party bosses can control or manipulate the smaller groups of uh, party uh, members and virtually dictate to them on many occasions about how to vote, um, even on matters which have never appeared in party manifestos, and even on things like uh, in the committees where there's supposed to be uh, cross-party collaboration and no whipping of votes, uh, uh, etc. Um, and then there's the weekly gladiatorial contest called First Minister's Question Time. First, First Minister's Question Time. Well. Most of the time, I watch it sometimes on the telly, and most of the time it seems to be taken up with the, the, the leaders of the parties, and not just the First Minister, but the, the leader of the main opposition party uh, always gets question number one, followed by various supplementaries. Then the leader of the next biggest opposition party always gets question number two, uh, and so on. Even at Westminster, they've got a better system because I often got question number one. And why? Because I assiduously put down the table questions every week or twice a week it was at one time when I, when I started. And, so, and it was the luck of the draw then. It was a ballot. Uh, and, and, and the speaker also had discretion about who was called for supplementary questions. Uh, so I, I actually think that um, the First Minister's question time uh, in the Scottish Parliament uh, is, is inferior. Uh, West, West, I'm not saying that Westminster is perfect, uh, uh, far, far, far from it. Uh, so anyway, my question, if I can say it, is this. <laughs> uh, uh, does the panel agree uh, that we should, we should have more cross-party collaboration and less control freakery? <laughs> because that's what we've been suffering from for the past quarter of a century. <laughs> OK, we're going, to, we're going to have brief responses. I'm going to... Um, I'll go to Ken first. Well, 
Uh, yes, is the brief answer. Um, the, par <laughs> the parties do exercise control, um, and uh, it's the nature of political parties. Discipline is quite important to get things done. If, if you want to get your agenda through, I noticed the very first thing that Keir Starmer did, uh, elected down south, was to suspend the whip from seven MPs that voted against him. And that's just that's an example of how parties operate. I don't think Keir Starmer's a, a control freak more than any of the other party leaders. All the parties behave in this way because they need to get, need to get things done. Um, so, yes, I wish it was less so. From personal experience, I remember I voted against the closure of the Victoria Hospital very early on and was severely... I was on, 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 I was on the back benches until Jack actually brought me back as a, a special advisor, or a, a, a cabinet, what's it called, a cabinet aide or something like this, um, four years later. But... Uh, Yes. So the answer is yes, but, you know, it, isn't it wishful thinking, Dennis? I mean, parties, isn't that how parties operate? They, we were talking about elected chairs for conveners. I think we'd all agree, th those of us outside would, would think that's a good idea. But the parties themselves, they like to have control. They like to have powers of patronage. They like to be able to appoint people. So they're not going to give up these things easily. Olivia, less control freakery, more cross-party collaboration? Well, I mean, Scottish Youth Parliament's a charity, so by nature we're a politically impartial organisation and it's also one of our key values. Um, and the beauty of it is we base all of our work off of consultation with young people, so at the end of the day it is the issues that are most important that allows us to have representatives in our parliament, no matter <coughs> your political background, and it also means that we can work with pretty much any politician if they're willing to work with us and they care about the same issues as us. It is young people's voices and views that are paramount in that situation. So for me, more cross-party collaboration is always a positive thing if it is fighting for those kind of key, really important issues. Thank you. And Brian? There's an evident tension between being loyal to the party and trying to get the government business done and being loyal to your constituents and your conscience. And that, that, that pools MSPs the, the, the entire time and so you, you it, it is understandable that, that a government especially a governing party but also an opposition party will try and get their business through i think it was disraeli who said damn your principles stick to your party and, and so there's always that that attempt to, to get the government through in the case of the the snp in the earlier years it was more self-discipline rather than discipline because they had the objective of of independence in in the air at the same time i, I welcome the the, the 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 contribution that that the likes of dennis canavan makes in challenging that control freaker as he describes it i remember also when margaret mcdonald stood as an independent she held a news conference in edinburgh and she entered to the sound of only the lonely which i thought was absolutely <laughs> uh, ab, ab, absolutely wonderful and, and there, thereafter she managed to disagree with pretty much everything that was advanced from, from various quarters. But she was also able to, to, to cut deals and, and negotiate when, when she thought it was important. I remember, just finished with this, I remember talking to a, a former Tory MP, it was Albert Macquarie, do you remember him? The, the Buchan Bulldog, as he, as he was self-described. Self and he was once, uh, he was regularly rebelling against his government. And he, he bemoaned to me on one occasion, you know, why is, why is his career being stalled? Why is he going nowhere? And I said, well, they tend to like people who vote for them, Albert. You know, that's, that's the, the, the thing. So there's always going to be that tension. And as long as it is a healthy, balanced tension, I think it's worth having. Esther. Thanks for your question, Dennis. And you triggered two thoughts in my head. The first one is the CSG studiously did not want to have First Minister's questions. Mm -hmm. And we lost. And I think that was a mistake because I think the civil servants in particular thought we needed a bit of theatre. I'm frankly not interested in theatre. The other, which the CSG misjudged, and again, this is not party political because it's true across all of them, I think, we never imagined the scale of ministerial appointments. A parliament of 129 and 28 of them are ministers of some kind or another takes a huge amount out of the parliament and also gives them a bit of that control freakery because there's the promotion prospects, etc. But to come back to Ken, and he and I love to disagree on this about the cross-party working, Whilst I accept a, part, a government gets elected and they need, need to get their programme through, well, in the system we have, very few of them get elected, even under our system, on a majority of the vote. And what is their programme? And if I come back to the health service, because as Alison mentioned, I've been in the health service um, off and on for a few years, I know behind the scenes there is much more agreement between the parties about what we need to do about the health service. But as soon as they come into the chamber, party politics kicks in and the public can see. 
if the government of the day says one thing, the other parties will say something different. And actually, the other word I don't want to use is opposition, because we didn't want opposition parties. We naively thought this multiple party chamber would not need to have an opposition. It would be collaborative. And for me, the public expect that every one of the 129 come here, as you said, to make the country better. And do we not need them to get round the table and thrash out? And yes, there's been some, but we've seen the kind of, I will say this just because you've said that kind of politics. And the public are actually fed up with it, I believe. And apologies for this, my microphone's not working, I'm told. <laughs> Thanks, Esther. Jack? The first thing I want to say is that we're all getting a bit miserable. Um, and uh, um, I want to pick up on the first thing Dennis says, which is having a Scottish Parliament is a lot better than not having a Scottish yeah. Parliament. So let's never forget that. You know, we would never have had, um, even if there was too much legislation in some years, we would never have had the range of rights, uh, the, 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 the land reform, the individual rights in health and education, for special needs and so on, all these things that we're we found legislative time for here that would never have been uh, possible um, for separate Scottish legislation um, at Westminster. Um, uh, so we not only had more accountability by having our own parliament, we had the time and the space to get things done. Um, and I think uh, we should never, never ever forget that. But um, when, when things are not working right, we should also have the courage to change them. And there were a number of very well-intentioned decisions made at the very beginning that do not work in practice. And they, they, they exacerbate this problem of the control of the party whips. They were designed to beat the party whips and to change the Westminster system, but the, that's not how they've worked in practice. The committees have already been mentioned. They're a very good example because the old Westminster committee system was a, a committee that looked at legislation that was run by the party whips and a committee that looked at wider inquiries and wider debate. And the, the, those who created the Scottish Parliament, they wanted our committees to be more like those second committees, more open to debate and inquiry and consultation and less to the party whips. And the opposite has happened in practice. And we all know that's the case. So we need to change the way that the committees function. And I think electing the committee chairs is the way to do that. The second thing that's gone wrong, I think, is that far too many of the members of the Parliament owe their allegiance to the party members that put them on the lists for the regional vote, rather than to the public that elect them. And that is a, uh, and that is a structural problem that has been there for quite a long time now. Um, Margot MacDonald is the only exception to that. Dennis was the only person ever to be elected as an independent in an individual constituency. Margot was the only person on a regional list as an independent to be, to be elected in the Lothians. Um, but the reality is that the vast majority of the member of the, the, the representatives who come in from the party lists, the party lists were created to make the party, the, the parliament more proportional and more representative and better than what we'd seen before. But the reality is that people are accountable to the party members who vote to put them on those lists, which the public then uh, vote for in the, in the general election. And we need to change that dynamic somehow so that people are all elected, all, all most, most accountable to their constituencies, not the parties. And the other thing that's wrong, and the First Minister's question is only one example of this, is that we need to give much more power to the presiding officers to pick and choose who's going to speak and who's going to ask the questions. The problem with the, with the question time is not the existence of a First Minister's questions. Having a good, strong First Minister's questions, where somebody like me had to stand there every week and prepare for it in advance and be on top of the subjects and know what we were doing as a government, be ready to explain, sometimes apologise, sometimes try and take the credit... To do that every single week was a great discipline to be for a First Minister, to make them do their job properly and to be on top of what they were doing and to be accountable for what they were doing. But if you then have all these structured questions that are all planned and picked in advance, one for this party, one for that party, one for that party, all picked by the whips and liaison with the, with the presiding officers, um, you know, that just, and to me, that's just wrong. You should have a situation where it can be much more spontaneous. Some, some, I say something that's not quite right as First Minister. Somebody up here has got a quick point to make on that. The presiding officer will be able to say, right, we'll take a supplementary question up here. And that doesn't happen in practice. It's never really happened in practice. And can I, can I just so I think, I think there's a structural point there about the debates and the question times that should be much more spontaneous, much more in the hands of the chair. Trust the chair 
to get a balance. You don't need the party whips to get a balance. And we thought we were doing something different in creating that structure where each party has their set question and each party has their set speech and everything's agreed between the parties in the Bureau because we didn't want the government and the data on the agenda. But the reality is that it's not worked in practice. It needs to be changed. And the presiding officer should be given much more control to make sure the debates flow and have a spark about them and aren't just dull and, forma and, and formalised. I know Ken is... I just want to chip in just simply because you, you won't comment on this, Alison, I know, but uh, there, there is some ability, well, quite a lot of ability for the presenter to choose questions. What unfortunately happens is you choose somebody thinking they're going to ask a, a supplementary question and they've got a scripted question given to them from the whips. I mean, it, honestly, it is so depressing. It, you know, you know will, will the First Minister tell me how wonderful a job they've done? Oh, my goodness, you know. I, but you get to know people because you get to know that Dennis Canavan is going to ask a difficult question and I can see a whole lot of former Andy Whiteman at the back there would always be good for our questions no matter what. So. I, yeah, I am going to go to, to um, David Stewart and, uh, and Andy Whiteman in a moment. I would just say on that and then we're going to get away from former MSPs for a while and, and, yeah, and I'm also going to maybe just bring in one or two panellists to respond so that we can get flowing along. I mean, I should say in a... In a normal section of First Minister's questions, there is actually a fair amount of spontaneity there. Um, the, the party leaders who are standing up to put questions, if they're a party leader of five or more, we don't know what they're going to ask. So the First Minister does not know what's coming. There are probably usually in any week three questions on the paper with a supplementary that are known. But there's a fair amount of room there. And... Um, I think I'd just say to you, Dennis, it's probably not a secret that I've been doing everything I can to try and make sure we have a better balance between leaders' questions and backbenchers. I'm very keen that we hear from as many diverse voices representing every corner of Scotland in the Chamber. But it's an ongoing Challenge. piece of work. <laughs> Challenge. Yeah, that is the word. I'm going to go to, to David Stewart and then to Andy Whiteman. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, David Stewart, former MSP and former Member of Parliament, and currently supporting Inverness Cali Thistle, so I ask for all your support and understanding of my difficult times. Yeah. Um, I'm a, a huge fan of the Parliament, and Jack and others have covered issues like land reform, which have been absolutely tremendous. But I'd like to touch specifically on Jack's point about elected conveners. Um, although I'm very proud of the 14 years I spent here, I was disappointed about the ability of committees to keep the executive in check. When I was in the Shadow Cabinet in the Labour Party, I moved a paper that we had elected conveners a la Westminster, so we have much more power for conveners, we kept the executive in check, and we also worked in post-legislative scrutiny, which my experience I've been a veteran committee member. We all talk a good game in that. But if you ask the clerks and you ask the conveners, some of who are here today, it just doesn't happen, Jack, in practice. So I'd like to ask you specifically and the rest of the panel, um, what can we do to make sure, irrespective of who's in power, that we keep the executive in check, that we end power, we revitalise our committee structure, and one aspect is certainly ensuring that we elect the conveners, but why not the whole committees? Obviously not changing the haunt principles of which parties should be in power. But I do feel that's work in progress. I'm glad Alison's mentioned a committee is looking at this area. But I left the Parliament a few years ago uh, happy with the great achievements of the Parliament, but disappointed that, for my part, I couldn't make any change because, frankly, the whips just didn't want to see elected conveners. OK, I'm going to go to Jack with that. I think people get the impression that I agree with elected conveners. Um, but I, I, my, my main point is that we need, you, if the structure's not working, the structures were all set up with the best of intentions, and nobody should ever feel defensive about them. But the reality is, 25 years on, some of the basic initial structure doesn't work. It was, it was, it was well-intentioned, but we, you, you then need to change the structure, not just hope for change. You have to make change happen, and you have to force the politicians to do the right thing. Um, and I, I, so I, th I think that's, to me, that's why you need, you need to actually change the structure of the way these problem areas work. Thank you. And Esther is someone who was involved from before the beginning. Yeah, well, and thanks. And it's a really difficult question, an important one. But when we did all the work we did around whether to have the select and standing committee model from Westminster, the argument for not doing that and having single committees was because we didn't have a revising chamber. 
and we envisaged that those committees would become powerful in their own right, the membership over the four years, as it was then, would build up expertise. Of course, what happened was there's been so much churn in government, there's been an endless churn. I speak to people on committees who say, I'm the only one that's been on this committee since the beginning, so that expertise isn't there. And in that 20-year review that we did when Ken was PO, we looked at whether we should go back and say, should we be recommending going to a select and standing committee model? If you take 29 ministers and the PO's team out of the 129, there aren't enough members to have two lots of committees. And my final point, which I was really glad you reminded me of, one of the things we were really clear that those committees should do was the post-legislative scrutiny. And I was really disappointed that I saw that being moved over to the audit committee and taken out of the hands of the individual committees, because I think that reduced the potential learning that those committees would have. But I think that, that I don't have the answer. I take a lot of feedback that there needs to be something and elected conveners would certainly be a start. I'm going to put this one to Brian too, before we move on to our next question, Brian. Yeah, I, 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 I take the point about elected conveners, and I think it would be better if, if, they, if it was seen as a, a career opportunity to, 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 to some extent. But I, I think the committees do relatively well in, in uh, getting out to consult. I would like to see them, as I mentioned earlier, consult with, with, a, with a wider group. But, uh, you know, again, from, from the, the, the early days, I think we, I'm, I'm going to endorse... Jack on this one, we, we are getting a little, a little bit too gloomy. I remember in particular one, one bill was the Adults with Incapacity mm -hmm. Act. Uh, and I recall doing a, a series of interviews about the nature of legislation and what had happened within the parliament. And I call uh, interviewing a mother who was, it was, was in tears, as she described the, the transformation that act had made to her family. I, I remember a, a very early um, business, I think the parliament in, engaged with business from a very early stage when business had been hostile or sceptical, they engaged, and, and the, the committees are, are all in that as well. And I recall going to an event at which this, this pompous ass of a, of a business man was, was saying, oh, the devolution, no use to me, I'm not interested. And, and I said, are you involved in property, aren't you? He said, yeah, I'm involved in property, but you know, nothing to do with me. I said, you do know they're about to abolish the feudal system and bring in a new system of land tenure. I said, what? And he shouted across to some flunky and said, meeting with the relevant minister tomorrow. And I thought, you absolute prat. You've, you've, you, you've left it too damn late, and, I, and, and I'm glad. So for, 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 those, for those who do wish to engage with the parliament, I think there are routes and, and, and avenues to do so. And, and I think perhaps we, we should give a little sucker and support to, to that endeavour. OK, I'm going to shake the order up a little. I'm going to go to the back row here, um, the third Yes, yourself. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Tajesh Mistry. I'm the chief executive of a national organisation called Voluntary Health Scotland. We have a focus on health inequalities and had the pleasure of convening a, a panel for a, a, a festival session earlier in the week looking at health creation. Um, I was really keen to hear from the panel about kind of the future a little bit of Parliament and politicians. I think there's an issue of the brand, if you like, of politicians and Parliament at the moment, and particularly trust attached to that. We've seen quite a turnover and, and challenge around leadership in particular. Um, so thinking about the challenges people are facing, um, you know, uh, cost of living, um, the fiscal challenges that we're facing, health, um, what, what does the panel see as an opportunity to start to rebuild some of that trust uh, and confidence moving forwards? And I'm hoping, you know, we're partic particularly trying to avoid the situations around people mobilising riots and so on uh, and the risks associated with that as well. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to put that to Olivia. Gosh, such an easy question. Um, I mean, it sounds simple. Well, you can say it in one sentence, and that's that we need a less divisive politics, but that is not easily achieved at all. Um, I think social media has really damaged our trust in politics and how we perceive politicians. Um, and I think for young people, that makes it really off-putting. Like, I, as a young woman, I don't think I'd ever want to stand for a parliament because the way that politicians get treated, and particularly young women and female politicians, is horrific. Um, and I think the trick that we've missed is instilling in young people from a really early age an understanding of politics and how valuable it is and how precious it is. Um, We've seen in the last few years a massive backsliding in democracies across the world. Um, and I don't think we quite appreciate just how 
precious this is. As I say, you know, Scotland, in my opinion, is the best place to be a young person. Um, and that's because of things like free tuition and free bus travel and UNCRC incorporation. Um, but we cannot take those for granted. There's a lot of young people in this room, which is really nice to see. And I want to say to you all, you cannot take that for granted. You have to keep fighting for it. Um, and that involves rejecting the kind of populism that is beginning to infect our politics, which again, it's not easy to achieve. Um, but I do think, you know, we look at how is devolution going to evolve? What are we looking at over the next 25 years? And that is preparing our young people to inherit this institution and to be responsible with it. Thanks very much, Olivia. And Ken? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned health because it's, it's of, of, the, of the huge issues that, uh, that the Scottish Parliament is responsible for, for the many issues, but of the huge problems that we've got to deal with, health is going to be, surely, well, perhaps poverty or health would be the ones that I would wish, in, in the words of Esther, again, to be bolder on. And, and the trouble with debating health in, this, in, in the Scottish Parliament, in fact, in Scotland generally, is it's, it's the NHS is a bit of a shibboleth. You know, we, you, you, if, if you were to bring in any kind of ideas about how to shake up the NHS, you'll be immediately accused of privatising it or you know, being anti-NHS. So, I mean, just somebody that's able to challenge that notion and have a genuine debate and, and say... We are very, very proud of the NHS, but it's not working as well as it should do. It's not delivering the care we need, and we need to do something to improve it. And yes, we'll invest more, but it can't just be about investment. It's also about, about surely about the way we deliver and we, the way we devolve responsibility to people within the NHS rather than have this huge bureaucratic system. But that, even just having that debate, that's what slightly worries me about um, sometimes the over, if I can say, over consensual nature of discussion in Scotland is that you, you, there's some subjects which are slightly taboo and you, you have to skirt your way around and you can't challenge. But, it, you know, poverty and the NHS would be the, the, the first two. Drug deaths, sorry, I'll start a list now of things that we should be challenging boldly right now. Thank you. I have to bring um, Esther in on this one with her little previous hats on and involvement in health. I think I'm going to risk being controversial. And I have had conversations with MSPs of all parties who would absolutely agree with you, Ken, this is, the NHS has become, I, I usually use the, word, use the word sacred cow, but a shibboleth. The poverty word's the important word. And actually, as someone who served as chair of two, three health boards, the service is on its knees, there is absolutely no doubt. But most of what they are dealing with is failure demand. And I made the point at the um, session that was referred to earlier, when I first got involved in the health service, just after the parliament was elected, 30% of this government's budget went to health. It's now in the high 40s and it's heading to 50% and that is not sustainable. And that money is coming out of, as one place, local government, who can't provide the housing, can't provide the education, can't provide the jobs that would prevent people getting sick. At the moment, can't provide the arts and culture that would help keep people healthy. And I am as guilty as everybody. We talk about health spending when what we mean is spending on the NHS. We should be spending money, and I don't even want to use the words prevention anymore, spending money on promoting good health, and that involves addressing poverty. And coming back to my other thing, and this is the really radical bit which will upset a lot of my health service colleagues, I believe we should go back, for one, to a system where public health and primary care sit in local government. My public health directors told me, which I didn't know, that's where they used to be because 90% of the leavers in public health do not sit in the NHS. I value and prize the NHS. It has helped me and my family hugely and I would not want to hurt it. It cannot keep doing what we're asking to do and it wasn't set up to do it. All over the country, there are great examples of communities and third sector organisations doing work around health creation and Voluntary Health Scotland is one of them. And I think that's one of the areas where the Parliament could be really bold and say, let's get into that discussion. OK, thank you, Esther. Very briefly, Jack. Very briefly. Can we just take this moment to move on from the, uh, maybe some, of the, some of the misery and the, and, and the reflection and just say that the best day for this parliament was the day when it passed the uh, ban on smoking in public places. Um, and, you know, that was announced in here in the first month of this new building being open. It was a big moment for a big occasion. 
Um, the reason that that legislation was so successful is not just that the legislation itself was well debated and scrutinised and then agreed in the Parliament. There were some dissenting voices, mm -hmm. but by a vast majority. But also, in advance of that, there was a widespread consultation for 12 months that convinced people, including me, that it would be a good idea. I was a sceptic at the beginning and I was persuaded to change my mind. And then after the legislation was passed, government got on with delivering it and implementing it properly, not trying to take the credit for it. Andy Kerr, who was my health minister at the time, got on with the job and with a great team of civil servants actually implemented it, working with local government, working with the health service, working with the police who were going to have to, and particularly working with the businesses in the hospitality sector. And it was the best example of, the, of, of a piece of legislation that was well prepared, well debated and agreed, and then well implemented. And it changed lives and saved lives. Mm -hmm. So in the, if we're talking about health, that's the example that we should try and follow. Having decided I was going to put that question to three panellists, then we've heard from Jack, I'm going to go to Brian to you. Please yeah, I, share your thoughts, Brian. I, I think there's always a, a, a difficulty in, in, in politics in, in getting one's perspective across. But, but I, I, I do think that one thing I'd put in is to give my dear co colleagues in the media a bit of a kicking as well, which is to say that um, politicians uh, often... Um, they come away with bogus nonsense when they're making their speeches. They condemn their opponents as the embodiment of all evil. They, they don't believe it at the time. And most ministers of my acquaintance are, are in a lather of, of, of uh, honourable indecision most of the time because they're not certain that which way to per, pursue. I mean, Jack, Jack mentioned the, the, the smoking ban there, and that, that, is a, that is absolute evidence of the fact that this parliament has the, the acceptance of the Scottish people because otherwise they would have simply uh, defied that act in, in total. But you heard Jack also mention that he had to be persuaded, had, that there had to be an argument. I think we need more of that authentic argument. Why do people, politicians, sometimes behave as if they believe their opponents are the embodiment of all evil? Because experience has taught them that that's how you get on the telly. You get on the telly by shouting and bawling. You don't, you don't get the telly by standing up and saying, well, I'm not very sure what to do. What do you think? Mm -hmm. And that's probably the honest answer from, from, from uh, a minister in, in, in most circumstances, certainly in my experience. So perhaps we could have some sort of a truce whereby we can have uh, honourable, decent media coverage in return for honourable, decent politics. But uh, um, I'm not sure, whether, uh, not, not, sure, not sure who could start that. M maybe some... Be someone else. Thank you. I'm going to take a question here. Um, I'm seeing more hands going up, which is very welcome. You asked an earlier question about the future of devolution versus independence. I'm really interested to know what, over the last 25 years, what additional, if any, powers has the Scottish Parliament secured from Westminster over that 25 years? And the supplementary question to that is, what additional powers do you, as panel members, think that Scottish Parliament could really make a difference to the life of us in Scotland with if we secured them from Westminster without going for full independence? Thank you. I'm going to put that to Ken. Uh, I think, I'm just thinking across, you, you've not got a very pro-independence panel here, I'm afraid. Um, uh, and so I'm just making my, my own political views clear. Uh, devolution itself is what I believe in, though, and it's about a balance. So, for me, there's no specific power. All power should be devolved as locally as possible, and that's the point I think you made earlier, Alison, about trying to devolve powers to a lower level, if, if at all possible, um, because we've, we've actually centralised powers in Edinburgh in a way that was utterly um, unvisaged, uh, you know, unenvisaged by the, by, by the, by the Parliament in its initial days. There have been quite a lot of extra devolution since 1999. Uh, Social security taxation powers, um, since Brexit, quite a few other powers are, are shared. And it's actually in that area that we probably need to do the most um, maturing, if I can call it that. Uh, the Scottish Parliament initially, the, the, the devolved reserve divide was very clear, very black and white. And the Scottish Parliament, we told the government in Scotland to account for the powers it's held, it's responsible for. There are now these shared competencies, as they're called, or common frameworks, and they don't get a lot of attention. So agriculture, fisheries, taxation now, social security now, these are shared areas of responsibility. And um, the, the idea behind them is that um, initially, the, the, the Scottish Parliament was responsible for spending lots of money, but not for raising it. So it, it wasn't particularly fiscally responsible. And you've got to try and find a balance of, 
how much taxes you raise and how much you spend. And I think it's, it's finding that equilibrium or that balance at the moment. But there's very, very little scrutiny of intergovernmental relationships, intergovernment agreements, shared competencies. And I think that that needs to be, that, that's the area that I would um, uh, uh, focus on. I, I don't think there is any specific power that, that is missing or any specific power. I mean, we should, we should just think in terms of where is it best that this, this decision is taken? Is it best taken in Edinburgh? Is it best taken at a UK level? In other words, are we stressing a common market, the common economy that is the UK, or are we stressing the local uh, decision-making that is important for the people that live here in Scotland? And it's a trade-off. And for my mind, I don't have a set list of things that need to come or things that need to go back, as it were. Olivia, would you like to comment? Um, well, I'll be incredibly blunt and say we're a third sector organisation. We quite deliberately don't have a stance on independence. Um, we instead encourage young people to use their vote and to use that vote in an informed way. So it's probably more valuable to hear from one of our other panellists on that point. Okay, Esther. Very tactfully put. I don't think the question's really about independence. It's to think about what, parliament, what powers has the parliament taken, and I think you've highlighted them, and what would we like? Um, and for me, there are three that come to mind, and I'm not a technical enough expert to know, but I think the Parliament could really do with proper borrowing power so that it can invest. I think it can do with more power, if not complete power, over immigration. Um, and I've lost the third one. Shit, Drat, what was the third one? <laughs> immigration, taxation and employment law. Sorry, employment law. And those are three that I know have been discussed. And I think some of those might even have been included in the Smith Commission or something around those times. But I would have said those are three powers I would like to see the Parliament have. And I think Ken's important word is maturation. I think we're 25 years old now, we're grown up. There are things we would like to be able to do that we can't, whether we're within the United Kingdom or not. And, and that would be my top three. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I think this is quite an important question. So if we can all just chip in briefly, that would be appreciated. Jack? Yeah, I'm going to disagree with Esther, so I think that's probably helped me, yeah. um, that we have a bit of, a, a bit of debate on this. Um, you know, I think the original scheme uh, um, was well thought out uh, because it, it was based on what needed to be governed across the whole of the UK, and whether that was a single market in the UK or whether it was immigration and borders or foreign affairs or the wider macroeconomic policy of the UK and then everything else uh, being be, essentially being devolved. Yeah. I think the one thing that was missing back then and it was because there was a, a fear in the population of Scotland, not elsewhere, um, of giving this parliament initially too many f um, financial powers because mm -hmm. there was a nervousness in, in, the, in the population of Scotland at that time about that. Um, the tax powers tax varying powers of the Parliament were limited in the beginning. I think it's absolutely correct that they have been changed uh, over the years and that now the Scottish Financial Minister um, and this Parliament have much more power over the levels of taxation in Scotland than they had in, in 1999. I think what's gone... Uh, this is just my opinion, and um, I'm not sure everybody will agree, but I think what's gone wrong in the last um, maybe 15 years or so is that we've gone from debating not just how best to use our powers here in the Parliament um, and debating how best to use the powers of the UK government in Scotland to this debate about who has the power rather than what you're doing with it. Um, and I take immigration as, a, as, as an example. That's why I wanted to pick up on what Esther just said. I believe you have to have one immigration, general immigration system for the, the islands that are the United Kingdom. I don't think you can have a United Kingdom without a single immigration system. But there is no reason whatsoever why immigration policy has to be the same in each part of the UK. And we proved that in 2004 when we set up the Fresh Talent Visa that was designed to deal with Scottish depopulation. It was a specific agreement with the Home Office. David Blunkett, who was the Member of Parliament, who was the Home Secretary at the time in the UK Government, came to Scotland and said the one-size-fits-all operation of the Home Office is dead post-devolution. Cannot be like that anymore. We have to be more... Um, flexible in different parts of the country. Unfortunately, that was not a view taken by any of his successors. Um, but we did, for a time, have a visa in Scotland that allowed more people to come and stay in Scotland than it turned around depopulation. We still had a one UK immigration system, 
and they still had the legislative responsibility, but we negotiated to get something specific for Scotland that was a real advantage. And I think there's not enough of that. And I, I hope with this new government in, um, in London, which has given some signals about respecting devolution more than its predecessors, I hope they will look at that because there are areas like employment problems in Scotland, you know, uh, uh, sickness benefits in Scotland. These, these kind of issues where I think the two governments working together could amend and adjust what they do more flexibly so that here in Scotland we can deal with some long-standing problems without arguing about who's got the power to deal with it and just get on with the job. Brian. I, I, I should wear a badge saying I covered the cross-party constitutional convention, which I did for umpteen years. I went on and on and indeed on. But I, I, it, it is remarkable the extent to which the final constitutional convention plan became the white paper, became the act, and became this parliament that we see here. And it is also remarkable the extent to which that structure has survived and has survived relatively successfully. As has been said, it was done by reserving a series of things and declaring that everything else was devolved. They didn't get it all right. They, 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 they reserved um, space, exploration of space, which was a dreadful setback to the Scottish shuttle program. It just put it, put it, back, put it back years. They also forgot about Antarctica, I believe, and had to, had to, the, the exploration of Antarctica, had to bung that in later as being a, a, a reserved policy. But there are always going to be tensions between parliaments and between governments, and I think we still see those. I do not share Jack's optimism about the, the current UK government being inclined to, to um, uh, devolve more. Or, or I, I take their point that they say they will reset the relationship between Westminster and, and Holyrood, but I'm not convinced that they will do that by conceding powers. I think the opposite is, is if anything, likely to be the case. I, I've covered all the various things, the Kalman Commission, the Smith Commission. I recall when covering the, the, the Smith Commission, the Treasury took up a, brought a team in, and, and, and occupied the premises where the, the, the Smith Commission was sitting deliberating on, on new powers, and they plastered the walls with various options. And I recall asking one of the senior mandarins at the Treasury, a very droll uh, individual, I said, it's amazing, you're working with an, an SNP Scottish Government. Do you trust the SNP Scottish Government? He said, Brian, we don't trust the Home Office or Downing Street, so why we don't, I, I, don't, I don't think we trust. So I, I think there is always going to be a degree of tension between competing power bases, and perhaps that's a healthy thing as well. Okay, thank you. So time is marching on, as it always does. I am going to work hard to try to improve the gender balance um, of this discussion in terms of questioning and also the balance between those who have not been representatives in this chamber. So I've got a few hands up already. I'm going to take them in the order that I've seen them. So the second row here, and then I'm going to go to the third row there. Then I'm going to go to Andy Whiteman, to Des McNulty, to yourself in the front row. So let's try and... I think I'm just going to put the questions to a, a, probably a maximum of two members, or we're not going to get through them, two members of the panel. So. Uh, sure, thank you. Uh, my name is Amanda Sloat. I came here in 1997 as a, an American. I interviewed Jack and, and some others in this room, weirdly obsessed with, with Scottish politics, and I'm really delighted to be back here 25 years later and, and see how it's evolved. I, at the time, uh, and, and the previous question talked on, on this, there was a lot of preoccupation about the relationship between London and Edinburgh. There was the debate about the concordats that were going to govern the relationship. And of course, at the time, 60% of the legislation that Scotland was dealing with was coming from the European Union. So my question was going to be how you think devolution has affected the way in which Scotland is positioned within the UK and, and also more broadly. Uh, so not wanting to get into the independence question, Brexit obviously has, has changed that. Uh, but at the time, we had Labour Labour governments in, in London and Edinburgh. We've now had various permutations of, of Labour and Tories in, the, in, in London, of, of the SNP and others here. Uh, so I'm interested on, on some of those bigger aperture questions beyond just how things have evolved in Scotland, how devolution has, has affected the way Scotland's relationship with, with London uh, and Brussels and more, more broadly has evolved as a result. Thank you. I'm going to put that to Ken and then to Esther. Well, I, I, I don't think there's any doubt that it's helped Scotland's uh, position, it's boosted Scotland's profile generally in the UK. Um, I think it's, it, it's, more than anything else, it's helped Scotland itself become a more self-confident place. Uh, Jack was talking earlier about the, uh, the, the uh, smoking ban as a, one of the landmark pieces of legislation. The, the reason that, apart from the health benefits, the, the reason I liked it most of all was that it was Scotland taking charge of our own health. Mm -hmm. Having this, we, 
in Scotland, we've always had the, the worst cancer, the worst dental health, the worst heart attack. You know, we, we've got a terrible record, and we were always able to blame it on somebody else. It was never our own fault, our own responsibility. And the smoking ban, so we were the first country in the UK to introduce the first. We weren't waiting for Westminster to legislate for us. And, and I think that that put that reflected a new confidence about Scotland and it put us on the map and it just it I just improved our, our I think our relationship with the rest of the UK it gave us a a new stature um it stopped the cultural cringe to some extent yeah. Esther um, I absolutely agree with your first point there Ken I think it's over the 25 years it has given us a confidence and I think people of Olivia's age and older of course we don't know Scotland without the parliament would find it really hard to imagine what it must have been like what you've reminded me though, Ken, is the night of the referendum in 97, being at the count in the EICC and realising how many countries had their media parked in that place to follow the outcome and hearing people talk about how in awe they were that we had got this far completely peacefully, completely peacefully. And I think that gave us a profile, which I think we have capitalised on. And I think one of the things the governments, and it's the governments more than the parliament in this instance, of all parties have done, um, sometimes in the face of opposition from Westminster, is they have used that um, stature internationally to position us. And, and we've had a number of discussions this week about what the, how the world sees Scotland. And I do believe, so that I'm not being miserable, this parliament has become a bit of a beacon and an international example. And I think that's been hugely positive for Scotland. The relationship with the UK, I think, as Jack said, has been um, interesting. And who knows whether Jack or Brian are right about where it's going to go over the next few years, but hopefully it will be respectful. Thank you very much. I'm going to go to third row here. Um, I'm Daniela Nguyenu, one of the MSYPs for Peace, and I'm also currently one of the conveners for the Scottish Youth Parliament. So yesterday myself, I was a panellist at um, 25 years of the Scottish um, Parliament, where are the young women? Um, and as an MSYP myself, um, I am involved in politics and whatnot. Um, and I know myself, young women, that are engaged with um, politics, but there are massive barriers, especially, you know, going from being in a youth space and then jumping from being like in a serious place such as the parliament. And basically, there is a, the young women are faced because we do see scrutiny and in the media with women MSPs. Um, and many of the young women, I believe, don't feel like decision makers take our views seriously. So, and on top of being a young woman, I'd like to add the intersectionality of being like an ethnic minority as a black woman myself, having a disability, et cetera, et cetera. So my question is to the panel, I would like to have the views both of a young person such as Olivia that is involved in politics and of somebody that hasn't been involved like yourselves within the parliament. How would you say you would want to have more marginalised people involved in the parliament because as as I'm standing here right now I am very privileged to be here but I wouldn't see myself working in a parliament let's say in five ten years time. Thank you very much and I will put that to Olivia in the first instance. Thank you for your question Daniela. Um, I mean it's really important to touch on the barriers that not only young people face but young people of intersectional backgrounds face. Um, this panel in itself is not particularly accessible to young people. Um, we're not particularly representative and also the questions and the jargon that we've all used by nature of the very complex discussions we're having would not be interesting to a 14 year old who is working towards their nat fives right now. I think um, we need to make this building more accessible to those people. Um, I keep banging on about it, but it goes back to education. Um, we need to be instilling in people of primary age just how important politics is. We also need to reform the education system. Um, we need an exam system that is not based off of memorisation, that does not privilege young people who are good at academics. We need something that allows young people to flourish in every capacity. Um, youth work is incredibly important in that aspect. Um, youth work, I was speaking to YouthLink about it um, earlier this week. It provided for me an outlet and an education that formal education couldn't provide and that gets overlooked so often. Um, 
I spent my teenage years going to free sports clubs after school and then I fell into the Scottish Youth Parliament. Like what I'm doing right now is technically youth work because I work with other young people and we meet up and we do fun social activities and whatnot. And that for me is what's provided me the confidence to go into this role and to go into politics ultimately. Um, so it is about that better education system and youth work funding in conjunction with one another that will make politics a more positive space for people of your background, Daniela. Brian, as someone who is... Study well, <laughs> As someone who is, you know, a frequent visitor to Parliament and as, as you know, been observing for many years, what changes do you see? What... What would your response be? I, I, as I mentioned, covered the Constitutional Convention. I also covered the preparations for this Parliament. I recall very, very vigorously covering for quite an extended period there was a, a gender balance, a 50-50 argument that there should be 50% women and 50% men in Parliament. And that, that argument was batted back and forward for, 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 for quite some time. I recall in particular one interview with, with Maria Fife, um, great MP, um, from Glasgow Mary Hill, I think, I think her constituency was. And I was giving Maria a really hard time and she was giving it back to me. And I was giving her a hard time on the basis of the 50-50 the gender balance argument. And finally she said, look, Brian, this really matters. Have you got any better ideas? And I've got to say the interview sort of came to a fairly abrupt close at that, <laughs> that point. Just, no, I didn't have any better ideas. But that argument proceeded and proceeded and proceeded. But it, it eventually concluded that, that the idea of a quota, uh, the idea of... of you know, some, some form of enforced or, or, or suggested um, balance within the parliament was not going to work, was not going to be capable of being legislated or, or pursued. And I think the feeling was then, and I think the feeling is now, that the parliament does need to be, really, really does need to be open to a range of views, a range of opinions, and a range of perspectives from um, w within the, the, the people of Scotland. But the best way to do that is to, to, to steadily remove the, the obstacles, whether they are education, um, social, participatory, or, or frankly financial. That, that, that you, you need to remove the obstacles and allow that balance to emerge rather than trying to um, set it down in, in statute or, or set it down in, in standing order. Well, thanks very much. I think I will just chip in here to say this session of Parliament is the most gender balanced we've achieved. 46% of parliamentarians are women. Um, personally don't think we need to get excited about that. We still need to do better because that's actually been a marked improvement on previous sessions. So there's still work to do, but in this session we've undertaken, you know, with other bodies, what is called a gender sensitive audit, but we've done it intersectionally. We know we've got a lot of work to do. It took until the last election to first elect women of colour to this parliament. But one of the things that, that our audit has done, we've set up a board and I can see various members here who are part of that group. We're not just sticking this report on a shelf. The recommendations are going to be part and parcel of the life of this parliament. And one of the things we're doing just now, actually as a result, is undertaking a disability audit because this building may have been appropriate in 1999, but you know, we expect more constantly and we're really keen to deliver more. So thank you very much for that question. I am now going to go to Andy Whiteman. Andy Whiteman, um, I used to be an MSP here. I live in Loch Haber and my mother lives on Skye and um, it's a two and a half hour drive to visit her. And I was in Sutherland on business recently and that's a five hour drive or a five and a half hour train ride. Um, but according to Scotland's current model of governance, that's my local area um, because they're in the same so-called local um, authority and most folk I speak to in Europe just struggle to comprehend that so has the creation of this parliament actually been at the cost of strengthening real local government? Jack. Great question. Two or three of the panellists have said um, I think uh, that you know, one of the next phases of the, of, of the work of this devolved parliament should be to devolve more um, power and control and resources to, to, to local government. Um, I would agree with that, but I would also, I think, maybe just go to a slightly bigger uh, picture point as well. <clears throat> I was involved, at the same time as being involved in the Scottish Constitutional Convention to create the Parliament in the 1990s, I was also involved in the, in the arguments around the reorganisation of Scottish local government in 1995. Now, in 1995, we basically had a small group 
um, of uh, Conservative MPs in, uh, in Westminster from Scotland who ran legislation and executive governance for Scotland um, from, uh, from Whitehall. And that motivated the campaign for devolution. <clears throat> and Ian Lang, who was the Secretary of State for Scotland at the time, uh, the MP for uh, the Fries of Galloway, he, or for Galloway, he, his alternative to a devolved Scottish Parliament was to reorganise Scottish local government, get rid of the old system of regional councils and, and district councils, and replace it with 32 um, local authorities. It was hugely controversial uh, as a principle. It was even more controversial in practice because some of the authorities that were created were massive, either geographically or population-wise in the cities, um, and some were tiny, Eastern Bartonshire, Clackman, and uh, Murray, and, and so on. Um, and, and much of the decision-making around the, bound, the borders and the way that this was going to work was very, very political. Um, that was 1995. We've had a Scottish Parliament for 25 years with the power to change that system and have a better system of local government in Scotland. It's not just about the powers and the resources. We've got a structure that isn't, is not working for Scottish education. Olivia talked about the importance of education earlier on. And it's not working in other areas as well, social work in other areas. We need to review that urgently. And I, I think 25 years on, it would be a great thing to do this year to get started on the work of unpicking some of the structures that were created in 1995, controversially. And I'm really, truly astonished that as a parliament, we've never done it. I'm going to, because we've hardly got any time left, I'm just keen to hear a couple of other voices. So I'm going to insist on very short questions and very short responses. Could I preface my question by saying, I'm so glad to hear you're doing something about access. This is the week in which Edinburgh has lost Ewan MacDonald, who has done so much for access, not only in Edinburgh, but across Scotland. My question, perhaps initially to Esther and to both of you, is nobody's really touched very much on cross-party groups, of which now there are so many. My question is, did you at the start envisage there would be so many? And is it practical to have so many? Esther. The, neither the convention nor the CSG ever even imagined would have see, uh, so many, would have any, actually, the cross-party group. And I think it does come back to the accessibility argument. Um, and I think they have created an opportunity, particularly for the third sector, but wider. But no, I don't think it's practical. And I know that MSPs have to sign up for a CPG to exist. And I know that many of them have got their names on more groups than they can possibly engage with. And given how busy they already are with their constituencies and their committees, I do question how sustainable they are. And yet, if you get the list, and it's over 100, I believe, how you would decide which ones we could keep would be a really, really difficult question because they are valued by the people from wider Scotland. But I don't think it's sustainable. Certainly an ongoing discussion there now, um, Des. Thanks very much. Um, 15 years ago, uh, Campbell Christie uh, put forward a commission that talked about public service reform and made all, all kinds of predictions about what would happen if we didn't do it. We didn't do it, and now we're there, I think. I mean, what he was talking about was streamlining public services, ending duplication, moving to prevention rather than failure demand, if I can, if I can quote Esther back. My question is, is the Parliament capable of taking forward the Christie agenda? Because what we've done is continually add things, you know, more and more duplication, more and more rights, more and more legislation. Should we have a spring cleaning year when we don't pass any legislation, but we get rid of some of the legislation that has been passed, and some of the regulations that have been passed that actually just get in people's way and make things more expensive? And I'll just give you one example. Monklands Hospital is being built at the present time. It's going to cost probably twice as much as it should cost or might have cost previously because of things like the requirements to have green boilers, the requirements to have um, single rooms. In it. These are all good things in themselves, but they have unintentional costs. And the Parliament is notorious for doing this. You know, if you speak to anybody involved in local government, they have to go through endless assessments of equalities, you know, a whole series of different things, which actually are a huge overhead. They're costly, they're time-consuming, and they get in the way of delivering 
what, it, what, what is there. So has the Parliament really got to have a, a self-denying ordinance? Let's get rid of some things rather than create things all the time. And is it capable of doing that? I'm going to ask Caden for his views on that one. Uh, well, I, I think it, the difficulty here is that it's government... It's, a lot of our discussion, we, we talk about the Parliament doing things. The agenda is driven by government, primarily. When you elect an executive, they, they uh, have the, set the agenda, control the agenda, and Parliament scrutinises it. Uh, but yes, is the short answer. Parliament should be, through the government, doing exactly that. We've had various attempts, though, haven't we? You know, we've had that sort of, you know, one in, one out rule. It, it never quite seems to work. So it, it, it often comes back to not, not wishful thinking exactly, but um, certainly good intentions that go, that go, that go nowhere. Um, if I may go back again to that word that Essie used at the beginning, it, it requires a bit of boldness. I mean, that's, that's the difficulty, but boldness is a bit like, isn't it, that, that, um, that warning in uh, uh, Jim Thacker used to say, that's very, you know, that, that's very brave of you, you know, Prime Minister. It, you know, it's, it's what we need, but it's actually potentially, politically, very, very, d potentially damaging. But I think, I mean, how many, how many of us would agree with Campbell Christie? I mean, so many of us would have quoted Campbell Christie, but we're still not delivering on his vision. Last comment to, to Brian. Yeah, I mean, the, the, I, I love that episode of Yes, Minister. You, you know, says the decision is courageous. Does that mean it's good? No, Minister. You know, so, and it, it went on from there. I, I, I think I think Des was, was once my, my MSP. In, yeah, I think, I think that's right. So it's, I, I endorse many of the things he says. Politicians need to learn to say no and to say it bluntly, and they're not currently doing so. They're saying yes and maybe and perhaps and can we add on things. The health service is in a complete and utter mess. Uh, the, there, is, the, there needs to be a limitation of demand and there needs to be a, a, a reorganisation of, of the service to, to improve productivity. And that needs to be done, if necessary, from the top, but, but perhaps done on a local basis by, by those who, who, who know the, the, the structure. The, the difficulty of, uh, about Parliament being able to achieve that is the difficulty of, of partisanship. Uh, I recall a health minister whom I rated enormously saying if, if you did a consultation on, for example, whether you should have gigantic hospitals with expertise or whether you should have cottage hospitals with, with, with local uh, loyalty, you, people would say we want a hospital the size of Edinburgh Royal Infirmary and we want it at the end of our street. And so the, the, the demand would be complete and total and politicians have to, to, to balance and choose between that. The, the difficulty in getting reform of the health service, particularly recently there was a, an attempt in the UK government to, uh, some time back to, to get reform of the care service and it was try, it was, it was the attempt was done to do it on a bipartisan basis so that one side wouldn't give a kicking to the other side's proposals when it came forward. It didn't last and it, and it didn't work. But that's the way there has to be uh, an, an approach on, on the health service and on, and on care. It has to be done in a way that allows the debate to happen without the, the partisanship intervening. And I know that you know, Harold Wilson said Royal Commissions take minutes and waste years, but, but some, sometimes the, the, it is the only way to do it, to examine the, the, the extent of the structure. But you're right. Meanwhile, learn to say no. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, we have to end there. I'm sorry that we've not been able to get to all questioners, but perhaps at um, our reception, you may have a chance. I'm sure our panellists will be very obliging. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for taking part. I'd especially like to thank Olivia Brown, Ken McIntosh, Jack McConnell, Esther Roberton and Brian Taylor um, for giving up their time to take part. And a big thank you too to our BSL interpreters, Jemina Napier and Andy Carmichael. So thank you to you all. And thank you too for joining us and your excellent questions. I think it's fair to say we probably could have longer for this session and that's certainly something I'll be suggesting in future. And as this is the final event in this year's Festival of Politics, um, I'd just like to say a huge thank you to our partners who've been part of the festival this year. All our partners, your support is very welcome. And also to our Parliament staff in all their various capacities who make this event possible. So I'm sure you'd all want to, to give our heartfelt thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much. Now, please join us now at the closing reception of the 2024 Festival of Politics. It'll be downstairs in the Festival Cafe Bar, where Alex Redick, the General Director of Scottish Opera, Opera will introduce a very special production 
of Scottish Opera's light-hearted short opera, in flagrante, and that will take place at 6.15. But thank you to everyone, because I can see faces who've been joining us throughout the week um, gathered in the chamber. It's been, you know, your attendance really makes a world of difference. It makes the event all that it is. So thank you for joining us, and I look forward to welcoming you back next year to the 2025 event. Thank you all very much indeed. <laughs>